Micronutrients have become an increasingly popular tool to manipulate color and growth of turf grass. They're called micronutrients because of the amount required by the plant for sustainable performance. It's exceptionally low compared to what we refer to as macronutrients. But what is often not discussed is the formulations of micronutrients and how that affects what is and isn't used by the plant. Or even what are the long-term ramifications of continued overuse of micronutrients? So today we're going to unpack how to plan and properly use micronutrients for turf grass. The most common micronutrients in turf are centered around the ingredients that cause typically the largest color response, magnesium, manganese, zinc, and iron. But there are others, and some of these are called secondary nutrients, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, for example. And then we have our miners, right? Like those we mentioned earlier, boron, copper, iron, manganese, molybdenum, zinc, chlorine, and iron. Micronutrients play many roles in turf grass, and there are many resources out there that explain what they do. But specifically, I wanted to dive into the world of understanding what form to apply and at which point they cause more harm than good. Micronutrients in their cheapest and simplest form exist as salts of metals. We see this most commonly on a fertilizer label listed as a sulfate. For example, ferrous sulfate or manganese sulfate, magnesium sulfate, or even copper sulfate. These are cheap, soluble sources of micronutrients. But being salts of metals, they are extremely reactive. With relatively little ease, they form insoluble compounds. These insoluble compounds are no longer plant available and thus will require more time and effort by the plant to use them. And in some instances, the plant can't even use them at all. Depending on soil pH and other nutrients recently supplied, sulfated micronutrients can quickly react into insoluble compounds. For example, iron phosphate, which is insoluble and not plant available. Manganese phosphate, which is insoluble, not plant available. Iron carbonate, which reacts to iron oxide. Iron oxide, also known as rust, which is insoluble and not plant available. Manganese hydroxide, which would oxidize into manganese oxide, which is insoluble and not plant available. Being insoluble and not plant available, there are only two ways to capitalize on these compounds being used by the plant. Number one is using a strong acid to dissolve the oxides. This could also be just having low pH soil. Typically, oxide micronutrients can become available if your soil pH is less than six. Number two is waiting on root exudates to release acids in order to facilitate the uptake of the insoluble compounds. Root exudation is a pretty interesting thing. And basically what happens is Roots will oftentimes release acetic, citric, fumaric, malic, malonic, lactic, tartaric, oxalic, and other acids. As an example, we see some of these acids, like are released in root exudates, in popular rust remover products. Remember, strong acids can dissolve oxides, and as an example of an oxide is rust, iron oxide. In the fertilizer industry, we sometimes see these ingredients used in dry fertilizer blends. Oxide micronutrients are cheap alternatives to deliver micronutrients to the soil. However, in turf, they typically have a fairly poor reputation. For example, here's a study from University of Kentucky. Iron oxide is the end product of iron weathering and more than 99.5% of the iron within iron oxide is water insoluble. No turf grass response to iron oxide has been documented in university studies. Iron oxide and all forms of iron oxide should not be used as a turf grass fertilizer. 
Other cheap alternatives to iron oxides include iron oxy oxysulfates, iron sucrates, or even iron humates. Again, from the University of Kentucky. Iron humate is the byproduct of water treatment facilities that produce potable water from humate-rich river water. Iron humate is approximately 30% water soluble with the remaining iron being in a slowly available form. Iron humate has been tested on turf grass using 20 pounds of iron per acre and resulted in no improvement in turf grass color or quality. Typically, soil applied micronutrients are not recommended unless careful preparation is performed to stabilize the micronutrient source with an acid. It is largely not recommended to use insoluble forms of iron unless, again as we previously stated, have a soil pH less than 6. There is one caveat and that is uptake through root exudation. Remember, root exudates, acids, or precursor compounds will be given by the root tip to the microbes in exchange for the soluble form of the micronutrient. While this will meet the nutritional demand of the plant, that overly dark green that we get out of iron applications, that typically is the reason why micronutrient applications are being applied, is not going to be there. Simply, the nutrients are just going to be utilized at the plant's requirement, which is often not at a high enough rate to induce the type of color responses the applicator is looking for. Using the growth probability model from PaceTurf, we can see the nutrient removal rate of iron and other micronutrients is relatively low. Here in this example, if 3.8 pounds of nitrogen is required, we see that what is actually required by the plant in terms of iron is only 0 0.019 pounds per thousand square feet. In each month of 100% growth probability, our iron removal rate is only three thousandths of a pound. Often we are applying iron at significantly higher rates. For instance, if we apply an insoluble iron source at 5% of a fertilizer blend and we apply it at 3 pounds per thousand, we're applying 0.15 pounds of iron per thousand square feet. This is 7.9 times the amount of iron required by the turf grass for the entire year applied in a single application. If we were to repeat this application across two or even three times through the course of the year, now we're at 16 and even 24 times the amount of iron required for healthy turf. Therefore, with difficulty surrounding insoluble forms of iron, we most often see micronutrients formulated as liquids. It's easier to control the rate because most micronutrients are immobile within the plant we can also take advantage of foliar absorption. And through foliar absorption, we have greater potential for uptake and utilization of these nutrients. However, formulated as liquids, there are a wide range of ingredients and even more specifically, chelations available. Sulfates can be applied as liquid and is a relatively cheap micronutrient source. There will be a portion of the micronutrients absorbed by the, by the leaf and the rest will become an insoluble precipitate in the soil. For instance, ferrous sulfate will become iron hydroxide, ferrous hydroxide, or magnesium sulfate will become magnesium hydroxide. If the soil pH is greater than six, these sulfated micronutrients will become hydroxides, like iron hydroxide. Then, as it oxidizes within the soil, it'll become iron oxide also known as rust. If you plan on using sulfated micronutrients, you could also run into some issues with certain herbicides. Chelates are a complex way of saying that they protect the solubility of the micronutrient. Because micronutrients are not soluble, they are not being used by the plant. Chelates protect solubility and thus are protecting plant availability. There are many common chelates that are now out there. We see them most commonly as amino acids, citrates, EDTA,
gluconeptinates, EDDHA, IDA. We're gonna take a look at this graph below so we can see how stable the chelates are in protecting the solubility, specifically here, of iron. Looking at this graph, we see EDTA, EDDHA, and DPTA fully chelate iron and thus give you the greatest level of protection. But we can see as our soil pH or soil solution crosses seven, we begin to lose protection from EDTA and DPTA. Glucoheptanate chelates are newer forms of chelates using sugars and oftentimes added protection against high pH soils. But you do not get the same duration of protection compared to something like an EDDHA chelation method. Typically within 24 hours after application, what is not absorbed foliarly will be quickly degraded in high pH soils into insoluble compounds. However, the advantage of glucoheptanate is the high foliar availability with some limited protection against alkaline soils. When choosing a fertilizer containing micronutrients, it's important to understand the formulation of the product according to the active ingredients. Specifically, phosphorus is one of the most reactive macronutrients when exposed to non-chelated micronutrients. As we can see in this video clip, mixing fox phosphorus with oxides, sulfates, and glucoheptanates produce insoluble solids. These solids are no longer plant available. In this instance, you're losing not only your actual micronutrient that you're applying, but you're also losing your soluble phosphorus that you've applied. Thus, applications of phosphorus should not be mixed with micronutrients unless a proper fully chelated micronutrient source is used. This is an example of a fully chelated micronutrient source being mixed with phosphorus. As we can see, they both remain crystal clear and thus plant available. As a rule of thumb, foliar micronutrient products can be applied at rates 2x that of the nutrient removal rate due to the absolute maximum foliar availability. Exceeding these rates can lead to issues of phytotoxicity symptoms where you may have heard of or even seen zinc or manganese toxicity or iron toxicity, which results in black turf. Excess soil applied micronutrients can help speed up the formation of something also called black layer, which kind of creates a whole new set of issues that's going to inhibit gas exchange, produce shallow or weak roots, and generally cause poorly performing turf. Micronutrients can be critical tools to increase the performance of turf grass, but they must be chosen based off the specific conditions in your environment. Too many times, money spent on micronutrients is purely wasted, and the majority of this is due to misunderstanding, misapplication, or applying other incompatible nutrients alongside of them. So I hope in today's video, you were able to understand more about how, when, where, and why to apply micronutrients correctly and to maximize your dollar spent. Thank you for watching. We'll see you in the next one.